everyone to the uh, Asset Management Outlook. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Just a few uh, housekeeping uh, items before we start. Uh, one, we would encourage you to use the app after the presentation to give us some feedback. And uh, if the conversation is interesting enough, please follow up on Twitter. Um, you all have the biographies for my esteemed panelists, but I will uh, introduce them. Uh, Daniel Lopez Cruz is the head of private equity for InvestCorp. And uh, next we have Neil Wilson, who's the co-founder of EJF, a $10 billion asset manager. And then uh, Rick Lakai, who's the CIO of State Street. And let's get right into it. Um, you guys don't want to hear from me. Uh, Rick, why don't you start us off with uh, some structural changes or disruptions that you see facing you as an allocator? Uh, and yeah, I, I guess firstly you have to ask where returns come from. We're saying how we're going to make money, where do returns come from? Um, they come from risk premia, um, they come from structural uh, opportunities, um, and I think often they're underestimated. So we focus on what the trade of the day is or what the kind of unexpected information is. Um, but those risk premia are very important in driving returns in the long term. Um, and I think right now, what we think people should be focused on is the opportunity in front of them in terms of risk. So we th we're risk on at the moment, it's very tactical short term. But in terms of efficiency of a portfolio, we should focus on how you can get um, exposure to those risk premium at very low prices, whether it's factor-based investing or smart beta, and then conserve your fee budget and your risk budget for those impactful active trades that are really going to make a difference. Don't over-diversify, don't have too many active managers, Focus your attention on things that are really going to pay off where skill pays off and where the fees pay off. Um, but I think now there's an opportunity for, to benefit from the equity risk premium, uh, but also some elements of illiquidity and some of the concentrated portfolio designs that we see are being very important, including private equity and illiquids. So when you, when you talk about concentration, because it's, it's an interesting topic, um, how do you think about concentration in, say, the top 10 positions in your portfolio or the top 20 positions in your portfolio. For instance, at the Brown Endowment, um, we have about 33% in our top 10 and about 54% in our, our top 20. And we have to balance preservation of capital with growth of capital. But how do you, how do you look at, at assembling your your portfolio in terms of concentration. What's, sure. How do you think about that? Well, I think from an active perspective, the fundamental law of active management is absolutely critical. The more, the deeper your information set, the more appropriate it is for you to have a very concentrated portfolio. Or to put it another way, if you know a little about a lot, then it makes sense to be more of a factor-based investor and diversify very widely. And I think there's room for both. So I think in a typical portfolio design, you'd have a factor-based investing strategy that, in which you were profiting from these very small valuation arbitrages. But then if you can find a manager who's got very strong insights into a smaller number of companies, you'd be much more concentrated in that part of your portfolio. The thing to do is not to mix and match inappropriately. So if you've got people who claim they know a lot and want to run a concentrated portfolio, you've got to be super skeptical. Neil, you, you run a very large asset management firm. How do you think about these structural changes and taking advantage of them? So uh, we're a regulatory event-driven shop. So we are based in Washington, D.C., and uh, we focus on changes in the regulatory world and how that creates investment opportunity. So for us, what we think is a really jugular play right now is really the small banks. So even though it's hard to believe that there is bipartisanship in the United States and Congress, in May of this year, there was something called the Bipartisan uh, uh, Relief Act, uh, Regulatory Relief Act, and it was passed with bipartisan support. And what it did is not undo Dodd-Frank as, as it applied to banks, but it recalibrated as applied to regional, and in particular, in our view, small banks. Because in the United States, it's very different. You have 100 banks here in the UK. We have 5,200. Uh, if you go back 10 years, you had 10,000. So there's a consolidation story going on in the banks, and the Federal Reserve wants that to happen. And part of the regulatory relief bill uh, that was passed in May is it creates really an opportunity to buy equity, but in particular, we think the most interesting is the debt. Um, and then the other thing I would just, as a related point, uh, say is that um, when the tax bill was passed in December of 1997, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, that was, it was known in the U.S. for cut, cutting corporate taxes and income taxes, 
but a very interesting provision which has been discussed here at the, at the conference, but I want to link it to the banks, is the opportunity zone, qualified opportunity zone legislation. So that's where there's a tax incentive you know, to basically um, capital gains and put it into certain, you know, what you would call here enterprise zones. We think it's very interesting from the bank perspective because unlike the way you have enterprise zones here where it was kind of planned in certain communities and sector based, in the U.S., it's the private, it's unleashing the private market, so anyone with capital gains can invest wherever they want within these zones that have been designated by the states. And in many cases, it's in the path of development, and it's very interesting. So small banks are the biggest lenders to construction and development. Uh, it's over 40% in the United States, small banks. And so we think that's really a jugular play to take advantage of what we see as kind of a disguised infrastructure play. But Neil, how cheap, are, how, how cheap? can you give us a sense of, of where the valuations stand? Uh, what are the metrics that you use? And are, are we, I mean, is this two standard deviations? Is this one standard deviation? How, how, do we, how do we get our hands around how good the opportunity is? Well, I think, I think the first thing you have to establish is the safety and soundness of where the system is, because that's kind of the question we always get. Is, you know, is, are they, when you recalibrate Dodd-Frank, people go, oh my gosh, are they you know, unleashing you know, kind of the, de the demons of 2007? And it's not the case. So if you just take the tier one risk ratios, it's 15%. And if you take, you know, um, when you take a look at tangible common equity, it's over 10%. These are for the big banks. Smaller banks are, are even stronger. Um, there's really been a regulatory shift. I think it's been a generational event, you know, the 2008 financial crisis. And I really think that there's going to be a differentiating way to think about how lending is done. So going to your question on valuation. So right now the most interesting play from a valuation on the equity side is in private banks, banks that are going to get rolled up as part of that consolidation I'm talking about. A lot of banks in the United States are under $10 billion in assets. They're logical pickups for regional banks, and they're the ones that have the valuations that are you know, 1.5, 1.6 times you know, kind, of, kind of their uh, tangible equity. So that, that's kind of the, or their balance sheet, they're, 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 uh, as, a, as a multiple of their balance sheet value. So it's a very interesting play on the equity side. On the debt side, there it's really buying legacy debt, live or floating debt, in a rising interest rate environment in the United States. You want to buy that because why? Because banks are going to take that out. And so if you can buy it and get at it, then you know, you know the banks are going to issue right now because of the regulatory relief bill in May, just to bring it full circle and then I'll stop, um, is that now banks are incentivized to issue fixed subordinated debt at 5 6% and take out their LIBOR floating debt. So if you can get at that debt, it's very interesting. Daniel, I don't want to leave out private equity. It's uh, obviously the world's favorite asset class right now. So um, maybe you could give us some of your perspective on how you are uh, thinking about disruption or structural change. What we're seeing, obviously, is not disruption. It's, uh, we're seeing an incredible um, sort of environment for private equity, uh, both on the supply and on the demand side. How, how long this will last, I think nobody knows. But certainly the last, the last uh, seven, eight years have been phenomenal. Uh, I think what we have is on the on the um, on the demand side, we have the uh, the pension funds, um, which are still today the, the the largest provider of capital for private equity. They have um, a big and widening funding gap. In 2007, before the crisis, the the U.S. pension funds had a 1.5 trillion uh, funding gap, which was roughly 20% of their liabilities were not covered by their assets. Um, ten years later, in 2017, the U.S. pension funds have a funding gap of uh, 3.8 trillion, which is 30% of their liabilities. And therefore, the search for yield for this very large um, provider of capital is, is, is enormous. And there are many reasons why this has happened, uh, but, but, but the fact that the numbers are the ones that I have uh, said. Now, these are very big institutions looking to deploy very large amounts of capital. Uh, what they are doing is they are... Uh, on the private equity side, on the, on the, on the management side of, uh, of this asset class, they are propelling the mega funds. They are propelling the private equity uh, sort of GPs or general partners that can really raise and deploy within five years billions, uh, you know, 10 billion, 12 billion, 14 billion uh, dollars or euros of, of capital. So we have that um, sort of that aspect uh, of incredible amount of, uh, of capital that is being matched by an ever-increasing ability for, uh, for raising and deploying basically bigger and bigger funds. Then you have um, other trends. You have other providers of capital like endowments, uh, like the sovereign wealth funds. Um, 
This, uh, this part of the market is more selective. Uh, they may favor mid-market funds. They may go into regional strategies, into sector strategies. Uh, they may not need to deploy in size, uh, like the pension funds. And in a way, they feed uh, the rest of the market. But it's still the market, you need to understand that uh, the last figures that we have, approximately 30% of the fundraising is done by the top 20 private equity funds. So there is, there is a consolidation going on, and, and, and the top brands, the top marquees, are getting to raise increasing amounts. And the question is, um, at what point they will reach uh, a level in, in which they just cannot deploy and, and, and consistently return three, four percentage points over the public markets. Right now, you, start, you still have people basically deploying, trying to deploy you know, 12, 13, 14 billion funds. Um, they have got there by being the best in class. Um, they are still probably returning. But nobody knows if that goes to 20 to 25, at what point, basically, it will be just very, very difficult to deploy that money within the five-year investment period of a private equity fund. Yeah. We were talking yesterday a little bit about um, how consistent your asset class has been. And one of, these, one of the reasons that was cited uh, was the structural advantages that, that this asset class has, where your, your management fee is essentially a loan, which you're given back uh, in, the, in the waterfall, and then you have an 8% PREF. So um, you've got to earn effectively a 10 before uh, you get your 20% uh, interest. Do you think that um, despite all this capital raising that the returns in this asset class are still going to be okay going forward or are you sanguine and do you think they're coming down? I mean, it depends on, I think okay by relation to public equities, yes. I think historically this asset class has delivered anywhere between three and five uh, points over public equities. And I think there will continue to be um, uh, basically a spread. The reasons are simple. Um, investors pay higher valuations for liquidity. And we see that. I mean, whenever we have a company and we are thinking about IPO in the company or selling the company to an industrial uh, buyer, nine out of 10 times we find a greater value in the IPO market. I, the public investor, will pay more for the same company than another private equity. And obviously, there's an obvious reason that that public share is, is liquid, whereas uh, you know, a stake in a private uh, company is not. So you have that, uh, that, that in a way creates part of the differential. And then it's leverage. Uh, any public company will have no more than two times of leverage. Any private equity company will have four, five, six times of leverage. And, and that, uh, obviously, if you are growing the business, has a compounding effect on the, on the return. So I think these two, uh, these two drivers will continue to play. Um, whether they will deliver three points or five points, it remains to be seen. Um, there will be big difference also within the, the different players. Uh, but I, I view those as a structural. They, they, basically, there is an illiquidity premium and there is a leverage uh, sort of compounding factor that is built into the essence of private equity and that will continue to generate more returns. Rick, as a large allocator, how do you look at the asset class uh, of private equity and what role does it play in a portfolio from your standpoint in terms of, of um, optimal asset allocation? Yeah, I think from, from an OCIO perspective, we have about 25% of our client assets in alternatives and private equity plays a really important role. Um, the bar is high, so 300 basis points or so over public equity would, would be our target. Part of what that comes from equity. But with so much money rushing in, I think we, we are concerned about the future return. And it's a very challenging environment because if you own a company now within an index fund, you're paying you know, a handful of basis points to own that company. As it shifts into the private side, um, the, the, the implied fee, including carry, is pretty substantial. So something has to happen to that company to deliver pretty extraordinary returns. And I think those extraordinary things have happened. You know, the disassembling of companies, the operational improvement, and obviously the leverage is part of the story as well. Um, so I do, I do think they play an important role. But if you step back and look at, the, for example, the pension system overall and say, well, it, it's its liabilities are looking like bonds and they're greater in value than the assets. Therefore, how do we get out of this problem? 
and the corporate sector that's the sponsor, particularly in the US, is pretty highly levered as well. And, and leverage has gone up in the private sector um, in the US. So it looks a little like an interesting uh, construct of a balance sheet where you've got liabilities that look something like bonds, you've got cash flows that are coming from a levered corporate, and you've got assets that, in a sense, are getting more risky because people want to get out of the hole and invest more in private equity. So you're, you're, a lot is riding on that growth opportunity, and if it doesn't continue or if there's some interruption, you've got to be very careful about your solvency and liquidity position. So I think you can be prudent and invest in alternatives, but you've really got to play it all through and say how likely is it we're going to get through, let's say, an extended cycle in the US without some sort of a credit problem. You know, we're very late in the credit cycle. And how could that rebound on my asset allocation? So they've got to be very, very resilient and robust. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, the industry, the private equity industry will tell you that you shouldn't try to time the market, that you should effectively make sure that you're uh, diversified across vintages. Do you, do you believe that, that that is the case, or do you believe that you should be opportunistic and flex up when there are moments of disruption or change? Well, I think the data would tell you that when, when you reach a peak in terms of new flows into the industry, future returns aren't very good. But that, and that makes it sound like it's easy. Oh, well, all I need to do is time then and, and not put money in when everyone else is putting it. But it doesn't quite turn out like that because apart from anything else, you want to develop good long-term relationships with GPs. Um, you want to develop reliable partnerships and have a flow over a very long period of time that evens out some of those bumps. But what you don't want to do is be in and out dramatically and run the risk of timing being diabolical. Neil, do you have, do you have thoughts on um, areas that maybe the, the group could benefit from in terms of, of, of looking at for people that are interested in compounding their capital over long periods of time? Well, I, I think one thing I wanted to make sure I touched upon was a little bit of our concern about where the credit cycle is, just kind of uh, going off a theme that Rick touched upon. I mean, if you think about the, um, you know, the leverage loan in high yield markets right now, I mean, it's $3 trillion. $2.2 trillion of it is below investment grade. Um, and where, and, you know, and, and the scary part is really on the covenants, right? So here's the statistics to take home. So in uh, uh, 2017, 75% of leveraged loans are covenant light. In 2007, right, pre-crisis, 30%. So things are getting a little toppy. And, and we are, you know, we're in the bank area, we're in the lending area, financing area. And so when we look at, you know, um, you know, where leveraged loans are held, they're held in CLOs. And CLOs are really been a function and that market's just blossomed because you've had low rates, you've had yield chasing, and you've had quantitative easing. And now we're kind of moving into, we believe, a quantitative tightening type period. And so that, that makes it tough to be in that space, you know, in, in our view. Uh, that's why we do like areas where interest rates are your friend you know, where you have net interest margin type businesses. You know, banks are an obvious one. We like, you know, again, go back to the theme of the small banks, uh, the regional banks, um, and we'd also say insurance companies. Small, uh, you know, insurance companies are just like banks, right? They're, they're borrowing from their premium payers, they're borrowing from their depositors, and they're, they're lending it at a higher rate. And as there's resets going on, you know, with, with interest rates going up, you can, really, you can really make a nice return. Daniel, a lot of, um institutional investors and uh, want to talk about partnering with firms like yours. What, what, is, what does that mean? Um, and how many of your LPs uh, participate in co-investments? And, and how many would you characterize have a partnership? And how do, how do you think about that? It is without doubt a, a trend. Um, it is very specific to the type of, uh, of investor, but it's, um, it's, it's, coming, it's coming and, and I, th I think it's here to stay. Um, I mean, I would say two things. Um, you have on the one hand this, the sovereign wealth funds, um, they, are, they are very focused on co-investments and even indirect investment, or getting co-investment as a way to learn and then at some point start hiring a small teams of people that can do their own private equity deals. I think the direct investment side is still to be proven. Um, we deal with a number of uh, these institutions and I think they have been very active and they're very willing to deploy capital alongside us in co-investments. 
Um, the ones what, what that percentage have, of what percentage of your uh, LPs do co-invest? Out of curiosity, roughly. I mean, probably like uh, you know, 15, 20 percent. Most of them will tell you that they want to co-invest, but but then when the opportunity comes and you call up and we have this deal <laughs> and we need to sign in four weeks and we are ready to share the due diligence, what do you think? Many either don't have the time or they find some reason not to. So, so the ones that are really committed to it, I, I, still, I still think it's, it's a minority, um, uh, but, it's, but, but I think it's a trend. It is something that we were not seeing in, in these amounts only, I don't know, five, six years ago. The, the other trend that we are seeing is in, in what we call sort of separate managed accounts. So people that are actually coming more from the perspective of, oh, do I really need to pay 2% management fee and 20% carry to InvestCorp or to this uh, fund? Or can I, can I cut a better deal by showing more commitment, more capital, um, perhaps with some few opt-outs, but otherwise getting a closer um, uh, sort of alignment uh, with them. This is completely deal by deal. This, this, these things are very <laughs> opaque. Uh, you, you really need to find a way to, uh, to, to, to negotiate this. It's increasingly uh, involving more than one asset class. Uh, so at Investor uh, private equity is one of four asset classes, but we have our larger business by assets under management is actually credit. So we're a very large uh, CLO manager, the third largest CLO manager in, in Europe and the ninth in the US. And, and oftentimes these clients will come up to us and will say, here you have half a billion. Um, I would like to do 60% in credit, 40% uh, in uh, private equity and the rest in real estate. We also have a real estate, a private real estate uh, business uh, within these parameters. Uh, do you let them move from credit to private equity? Because one of the things, and I'm, uh, Rick, I want to push you on this, is the opportunity cost, right? You're, you have a forward commitment when you commit to a private equity firm. So how do you, how do you think about that cost of capital if you're going to have to set it aside or... Um, you know, are you allowed to put it in an in in InvestCorp product and then move it over to the, to the fund? Because many people would say private equity returns are somewhat overstated because of that opportunity cost. We're not taking uh, account of the, of the cost of having to hold on to that capital for the capital call that, that you will get. So, so this, this would be people that would be looking to deploy more than they would deploy in, a, in, in any of our vehicles or, or, or funds. Obviously, people with whom there is a lot of trust, they know us, they know us probably in different asset classes, and the relation has got to a point where they can come back to us and literally tell us we have 400 million to deploy. They would never put 400 million in one of our vehicles because we are a mid-market uh, sort of player and, and, and our vehicles are not of a size for anybody to take that, that sort of bet. Um, and without going to the specifics, we would cut with them a better deal than just 2% 20. Uh, write that down, write that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it is going to be case by case and it's going to be completely tailored to that specific um, uh, sort of uh, institution. And we hear that this, this is happening across, so it's not only with us. Um, everybody's entertaining this, uh, in these discussions. Uh, and obviously the investors are looking for ways to lower the fees. Um, and this is, I think, part of, I think the co-investment is one part because most of the co-invest comes with really no management fee, no, even no carry or very low carry. Um, direct investment, obviously, the same. Uh, and and this, is, this is somewhere in the middle. Can I add to that? Sure, thing? absolutely. Yeah, and, and I didn't mean to uh, cut into your uh, point, because I would agree with it wholeheartedly. I mean, if somebody is willing to partner with us, whether it be a large pension, a large institution, um, you want to build that relationship. And we have found, and we've changed kind of the way we started thinking about our investors three, four years ago to try to make it more deep dive with you know, fewer clients. That, and, and that's been a very um, fruitful exercise. And it's also made us, so we, just like I'm sure it's the case with Daniel and Rick, I mean, you, you really get to know your client and where they have interests, and, and then it becomes you're a partner, and, and you're willing to cut fees, you're willing to do all those things, because if, if you know what that pension is looking for, you can out refer them to other, your cohorts in the business, and you're really solving problems, and ultimately that's what people want. So I know it's a simple concept, but I would say we had to actually take a, a conscious undertaking to, to take that approach.
I mean, I'd agree with the premise that you can't, can't chop and change without being a cost to it. And so the question from a total portfolio management perspective, how do you manage solvency and liquidity and the opportunity set in an intelligent way? And we have a, a methodology called the path forward that takes account of all of the calls we've got, what we're doing in the real estate side, on the direct side, on the indirect side, with co-investments, but also the, uh, the rest of the portfolio. So if we're feeling a little uneasy in terms of where we're on the credit cycle, we've got a lot of other exposures within the portfolio that are more liquid that we can use to manage our way through. I think on the illiquid side, the key is to be consistent and not to incur those opportunity costs if you possibly can. But look at the total portfolio. You can't look at what you're doing in private equity and say, right, I want that return in private equity without thinking about it in terms of the total portfolio context. And I think the, the best GPs also understand that, that they're, they're a component part in a total portfolio solution. And I think if both parties operate in that way, you can actually, you know, you can operate harmoniously. The disaster is if you treat those people like they are a tool that you can kind of chop and change and come in and out of. But Rick, how do you think about the forward commitment? Because you know, for a lot of um, U.S. endowments and foundations, where your uh, illiquid assets are now, you know, in the case of say Yale or <coughs> Princeton, are close to 50 percent. Uh, behind that 50 percent is an inherent forward commitment to keep the uh, level of your privates at that level. So how, how do you think about that obligation that you have to fund going forward? And how do you think, think about that within the context of, of a portfolio? Do you, do you ignore it and, and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to fund it from cash or I'm going to fund it from inflows? Or, or how, do you, how do you think about it? Well, you definitely can't ignore it. I, mean, I can't speak for those institutions that you refer to. But if I was given the job of managing them, I'd certainly think about that forward you don't commitment. You don't want that job. <laughs> you have a better. The forward commitment. And, uh, and the cash flows and the liability that you've got there and the solvency of the whole institution. You can't, you can't take one thing and say, well, I'm going to concentrate on that to the exclusion of everything else. But if, you are a very, if you've got long-term horizons, as they should do, then you should be prepared to weather some degree of liquidity risk. But as we know, through 2007, 2008, a number of people thought they were long-term <coughs> investors. But then it turned out that when, you know, when, the, when the balloon went up, so to speak, um, they weren't very long-term at all because they didn't have a choice. They were called on their long-termism. And so I think if you think you're long-term, you should think through your past dependency very, very carefully before you make a commitment that gives you a liability that you can't fund. Um, and you have to look, at, again, at the total portfolio, the assets, the liabilities, the cash flows coming in, and stress test those. How risky, how, how exposed to other risks are they? And what's my correlation risk across the total, you know, the total balance sheet? So, so in a um, portfolio, an institutional portfolio that you would design, at what level would uh, privates, what, 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 what feels right to you in this, in this current environment? Uh, in it, probably less than the 25% we've got in alternatives includes both liquid and illiquid alternatives. Um, and I think the, certainly the illiquid part will be a lot less than the total 25%. Um, but it really depends on the context of the institution that you're supporting. If they've got a very strong covenant and cash flow, then you can afford to be much more long-term and worry less about liquidity. Um, but I think given where we are in the cycle, particularly in the US, given the state of leverage of many corporations, I think you've got to be a little bit cautious about pushing that boundary up too high. So I'd be at the kind of lower end of the boundary rather than the upper end of the boundary at the moment. If I may just add one thing, I mean, if you're going to have a private equity program at an institution, um, and I've sat, I've sat on, uh, uh, you know, pension boards and endowments, I mean, you want a secondary strategy as well, so you can buy secondaries for those that don't manage it well, and you can also deploy money, you know, quicker and more tactically if you have a secondary kind of allocation for, you know, people who are selling their LP interests. Um, so that's a pretty active market. So I would say that's something to keep in mind. I think the secondary market point is, is, is a great one because um, I think it's changed the asset class. Um, many of my peers are regularly trading uh, in the secondary markets at NAV, obviously lagging maybe you know, a quarter. Are you, are you finding that, that clients are, are, are trading in, um, in the secondary markets? And how, how does that, what percentage of your clients do you think 
trade? Probably none, but... Not a lot, uh, yeah. but what we're finding is a lot of interest by the secondary asset managers for us. So, so some of these uh, firms like you know, Lexington and, 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 and the likes, they are very actively approaching, I think, all of the GPs just to check if, you know, do you have some long tenured uh, assets from some old funds that you would like to basically transfer your uh, LP interest? Um, so there's, there's clearly a lot of money in that, uh, in that asset class. I think that has gone from being a bit of a residual, uh, almost, you know, almost re relegated to deal with, um, uh, with some, you know, long or, you know, travel portfolio for some managers. And now it's been, I think it's been used in a much more mainstream fashion and, and, and I think that sub asset class has come of age and, and I think it's here, it's here with us to stay. Um, where, where do you come out, Daniel, on uh, a generalist approach versus a specialist approach? We know what the academics say with regard to private equity, but where, where do you come out on that, and, and where do you stand in terms of um, your outlook on what's the size of a fund to maximize both the return and the risk? I have to defend how, how we do it because we think there are strong reasons why we do it um, uh, the, way, the way we do. I mean, we, we are sort of mid-market and, and we focus on four sectors which are quite diverse. Um, I mean, so diverse that you could argue that we are more of a generalist than a, a sector-specific um, uh, manager. So we focus on, on, on industrials, on business services, on technology, and on consumer. Uh, consumer, we used to call it before consumer and retail. I think as of late, we, f we find very, very few retail opportunities that, uh, that look appealing. We use these four sectors dynamically. So I can tell you right now that pretty much 100% of the industrial opportunities that come to us, they are dead on arrival. I, there's, there's very little appetite internally to pay 10 times EBITDA with the leverage that the banks and, and, and funds and CLOs are offering even for industrial businesses today where you, know, you find yourself uh, Italian industrial companies covering some industrial niche, people paying 11 times and financing markets offering six times of leverage. We're not doing that, but we have successfully invested in industrial companies in 2011 and in 2012, uh, paying for them six times and seven times and levering them two times and then getting the whole benefit of the up cycle and then the valuation expansion. We so have also made mistakes. You're sounding cautious in that area right now. No, completely, yeah. uh, completely. And, and in part it's because we made mistakes in 2007. We also bought some industrial business in 2007 for which we paid over 10 times. We levered up seven times, and then we spent 10 years rowing just to recover, in some cases, not even 100% of the capital. So that, that lesson has been learned. Um, right now, I would say 90% of the things that we're looking at are business services and, and technology. So low capital intensity, as low cyclical um, uh, sort of reactivity as we think uh, a company can have. Everybody will have some level of you know, cycle response. Um, and quite honestly, with as low leverage as we can. So we, yes, the, 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 the financing markets are crazy. We, we, we are not taking all of the leverage that is on, on offer in most cases. Can uh, I because just re return to your point about secondary markets? Because I think it, it's an amazingly healthy development um, to see more activity in the secondary market. And I think I'd agree. It used to have a poor reputation. In other words, people trying to get out, and it was a difficult relationship maybe with the GP. Um, but I think if you step back and say, what, what will be in the interests of capital markets overall in the economy, it probably is a flourishing secondary market that would give better information disclosure, would allow people liquidity, and would maybe eliminate some of what is a very artificial gap between public markets and private. So, I mean, obviously, you see a lot of companies going to the private markets for good reason or bad in different parts of the world. Maybe it's regulatory driven, maybe it's opportunity driven. Um, but that has become a big wedge, and I don't think that's in the interests of economies as a whole to have that big wedge. So the question is, can you begin to chip away at the differences? And I think the secondary market is a very, very powerful tool, particularly if you can destigmatize it, because I still think there's a little bit of a stigma in private equity with, with secondary um, activity. 
so I, I think it's a really healthy development. And if we're here to talk about disruptions, particularly in the asset management business, I think that's one that we could see growing quite a lot. And in 10 or 20 years' time, the relationship between private equity, fees, public equity, disclosure, all the other issues that we should be talking about, like ESG, I think will be very positively influenced by that. Why don't you touch on ESG? Because it's a, it's, it's a very... Um polarizing topic among a lot of investors. Maybe you can just, I know you've thought about it, maybe you could just touch on it quickly. I'd love to. Um, yeah, we believe ESG is a strong driver of returns and risk for investors. Um, and we think there are, there are those investors who talk about ESG as an either or, either I can have ESG or I can have returns. At State Street, we believe that people evaluating an investment should look at it through all the lenses they possibly can, including ESG, and that you'll get better returns and better control risk if you apply at least your ESG lens as well as everything else. But I think we are seeing a dis divergence in this subject matter between different parts of the world, frankly, uh, that's rather unhealthy. We seek to bridge that divide, but I think it is becoming challenging. We're sitting here in Europe, um, which is an area that's embraced ESG, um, but that's not true in all parts of the world, and I think that divergence is actually rather unhealthy. Yeah, on, on the ESG point, I would just, and we, uh, Rick and I were talking about it before the panel, um, I mean, the corporate governance part is, is I think, a, a really important one, and, and there is a difference in how Europe tends to think about things in the U.S., so you mandate, you know, women have to be on corporate boards, right? Um, he, in the U.S., we don't mandate it, but there's a lot of discussion about it. And so in that case, I would say it's the mandatory component would be a better policy, actually, because that would force. It's like um, we have something called Title IX in our college sports, and it's made a huge difference. You basically have to spend the same amount of money on the boys' sports as the women's sports, and it's made a massive impact. I have five daughters, so I can, I, I can, I can attest to this. Um, but I think that, um, you know, in, 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 in terms of social impact investing, I would go back, and again, this is not a U.S. crowd, but I would, I would say people should look at it. The opportunity zone versus your enterprise zones, again, it's a different mindset. You kind of have a government involved, here's 24, Birmingham's going to do industrial, and, you know, on and on. In the U.S., we, we just, uh, it was, again, this was actually bipartisan. Um, part of the tax bill is the only part of the tax bill that actually got bipartisan support, and it's actually a progressive, out of a progressive think tank, the idea of investing in these opportunity zones. And we think that is the best social impact investing in the United States in terms of an opportunity. Um, you can do real estate or you can do businesses. We do think it's going to have a seminal uh, impact over time in the United States because the carrot is huge. You know, it's the ability to take capital gains. So let's say you have Netflix stock you know, low basis, or you start a company low basis, you have you know, stock. In New York and California, you're going to pay 50% short-term capital gains. You can take that, defer that gain for eight years, put it into a real estate project that's in Oakland, um, and you can get stabilized kind of, you know, returns after two or three years of, you know, kind of investing. You have to hold it for 10 years, but then you get, you pay no capital gains after you've realized the investment. So think about that. That's huge. Think about it, what it does for the VC community and the private equity community. So my, I have one of my daughters uh, is a computer science major. She lives in San Francisco, like all the millennials want to live in San Francisco. She gets on a Google bus and goes to work, right? They want to live, the millennials want to live in downtown San Francisco. They want to be where all the cool kids are, right? But <laughs> what would be the problem going two BART stops into Oakland in an opportunity zone Nothing, right? They'd be happy to do it as long as they can go back, right? And they're going to spend their discretionary money suddenly in these opportunity zones like Oakland. And it, it, it's uh, the, the VC community, the private equity community, if you hold an investment for 10 years, they're going to pay no capital gains. So think about what that does on your carry, right? You're paying no, gain, you know, no tax on your carry. That's unbelievable. But the most important part about it is it creates a lot of jobs. Um, we're doing one project, for example, it's outside Savannah, Georgia, the port, and it's an industrial uh, and, and it's going to create 2,000 jobs, and it's going to do it in an area that's economically been underserved with capital. And so we think the second and third order impacts are going to be huge. And I know other people at this conference agree with that, um, but we, we're already putting money to work, and, and we, we see it um, in, in, in the projects we're doing in Oakland and, and Savannah, Georgia, and Washington, D.C. Um, and what I would say is um, 
think about what it, the second and third order impact. So JP Morgan announced a month ago that they're putting $500 million into three cities in these in poor areas, economically challenged areas, Detroit, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. Now, Jamie Dimon's a great guy, and he's a well-intentioned person, but he's also doing it because he gets Community Reinvestment Act requirement taken care of. He can check the box that he has spent money in underserved areas and meet his CRA regulatory obligations, right? So it's a win-win. It's a um, and what is that going to do? That's going to be a catalyst for another billion dollars on top of his 500 million, or the bank's 500 million. So we think it's huge. And again, if you're a U.S. investor, it's a no-brainer. If you're not a U.S. investor, you have to play it kind of indirectly, and, and I'm making the case for the small banks and the regional banks. It sounds like it's hard to compete with that uh, risk-reward uh, opportunity in the States, but, but where else, if we look worldwide across the asset classes, um, where, where's the opportunity right now? The people in the room probably want to know. And I'm not talking about a, a short-term trade or uh, some little tactical flip. I'm talking about where, where do you see people compounding their money over a period of you know, years and Could years? Just talk about China and ESG China combining the two, because I think there is a kind of image of China that's the old China, smokestack China, you know, fixed investment spending and exports. But it's clear there is a plan to, um, to change to a more consumer-oriented economy. And right from the top, there's been a very clear message that the financial community is there to serve the people and the economy, and particularly as it relates to environmental social and governance issues. And so I think the way that the A-share market is evolving and opening up is going to give you a double opportunity. One is, we, we know at the moment it's under pressure because of the trade tariffs and everything else, but if you look at long term, there's probably a fantastic opportunity there as, as China continues to grow and rotates its economy from the old smokestack to a more consumer-orientated, technology-driven economy. But alongside that, you've got this ESG lever, which I think is particularly important in China that's had a history maybe of you know, neglecting some of those issues. But right from the top of the country comes the message, this is something we need to pay attention to. So I think that's a really interesting compounding opportunity uh, that actually combines two interesting uh, drivers of return. It, that's very interesting because obviously China is, I don't know, 22, 23% of world GDP, yet my sense is, is that people are underinvested there. What do you think is the appropriate uh, range? I'm giving you a, a, a range of, of what uh, an institutional investor should have allocated to China given uh, geopolitical tensions and given the uh, what people would criticize as the lack of a, of a rule of law. What do you, what do you think is a responsible uh, amount. Um. So I, I <clears throat> the, the, the size of the capital market was just it's a very big number. We, in our advocacy with index um, calculators and others, have said you've got to rein that back because we don't know the future in terms of um, capital controls, you know, the, the degree to which our clients can move money in or out, um, or the history of suspensions of stocks. That is becoming a better story, but I think we'd still have to be really cautious. And so I think you know, putting it in at 5% of your emerging market portfolio moving up to 10 is a reasonable number. But I think for longer term investors who can get past, you know, the, the governance issues and understand deeply what companies are doing, you know, again, the apocryphal uh, concentrated investors who have a long time horizon, I think you can go higher than that. But you've got to be there um, in a way that helps you to navigate through those, those interrupts because I think there's no doubt that the... the um, you know, the government mindset is to protect the people, and that may come at the cost of occasional capital control, controls or constraints. Daniel, what's InvestCorp's view on, on China? Do you play there? Um, I, I tell, tell us how. Um, we're very positive on China. We have just made our first investment uh, in China about two months ago, so we've invested $150 million on a pre-IPO technology portfolio. Uh, so these are companies that um, we think will be IPO within the next uh, three, four years. Uh, very fast growing, still very little cash flow because they're reinvesting most of what they uh, make. Um, and it's on a portfolio basis. So we, we've invested in a portfolio of uh, nine, ten companies with a partner, with a Chinese partner. Um, 
I mean, there cannot be better testament as to what we think about China. We did that, by the way, in the middle of all of the you know, tariff war with, uh, with the U.S. because our expectation is that whatever happens, the size and the magnitude of the country is such that you, you, you have to be there. Um, we are also very positive on Southeast Asia and on the subcontinent. We think that if the trade war with the U.S. actually cannot be averted, Southeast Asia will be a very big beneficiary because what is going to happen is many of the Chinese manufacturing companies are going to transfer the last mile of production to Vietnam and to all of these countries. And from there, they're going to export into the U.S., into the rest of the world. They're not going to basically shut down their businesses. Uh, that's when, when, when you talk to the businessman in, in China, that's what they're all telling you, that is the contingency plan. And probably it's going to happen now no matter what, because they have seen that the risk is, is there and the US administration may, may just become for a long time more belligerent. So I think so Southeast Asia... Would you Asia, also partner with people in those markets, or, or would, you, would you do something... I, I think those markets are a smaller, um, and, um, and, and therefore probably it's a second step. I mean, so far we have invested in, 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 in China and we have a smaller investment in India also that we have done over the last sort of, you know, six months. And we see these two as, as, as the places where we should over time develop our capabilities with the help of partners because they are, they are very local markets. You really need to know the ground and we cannot just shift. My team here in Europe, we have Chinese speakers, which we have hired in anticipation of this happening. Um, but I cannot just basically ship them there and hope that they're going to be doing deals and that they will know the lay of the ground. Uh, we need to do this with, uh, with, 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 with partners and, and over time we'll learn and, and, and probably we'll, we'll be able to set up our own sort of teams there. But very positive uh, on the region. Um, yeah. Rick, pre-crisis, pre um, pre the financial crisis, the emerging markets compounded over a 10-year period close to 13%. Post-crisis, they've compounded at about 3%, and the S&P is compounded at 12.6% roughly in those, those periods. When you look at asset allocation, are, are you, are you a, a bull on, on EM? Uh, it, it certainly seems that it's an asset class that everyone talks about. Um, would, would that be an overweight in an institutional portfolio? It wouldn't be a short-term overweight. Um, short-term or overweight US, actually. I think EM in equities is a great value opportunity, but we need a catalyst for that value to be unlocked. And really, that does revolve around the trade and tariff um, discussion that we're seeing at the moment between the US and the rest of the world. And I think what, once that is resolved, and I think the presidential um, you know, election timetable suggests that that's going to happen reasonably quickly, I think the, there'll be a catalyst for that short-term so if you're asking me short term, we're a little bit underweight. Longer term, I think we're absolutely optimistic about emerging markets delivering on a return premium relative to developed markets for all of the kind of catch up reasons and the fact that the return on equity is higher, the price to book ratio is a little bit lower. So it's set up quite nicely for long term returns. Does, um, does anyone have any further sort of areas that they'd like to discuss? Because I, I think I'd actually like to open it up to some questions. I think that might um, be the most beneficial for the group, if that's OK. Yep. Sure. Uh, question from Mr. Rick Rakai. Sorry. Question from Mr. Rick Rakai. We invest in some of your ETFs. Very happy. Thank you. Um, question with... That's not fair to have a plant that's like right. that. That's <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> Come on, hands up if you invest in our ETFs, everybody. Well played, well played. <laughs> But um, with the huge increase in the amounts invested in ETFs worldwide, can you see dangers down the road? Let's say like if there's a major financial meltdown or something like this, 50% uh, meltdown or more, whatever, would you see dangers and liquidities or issues that you know, people are not f forecasting? And the second question to you is, cybersecurity, which everyone is faced with today. Um, have you got or we, might you have a ETF for cybersecurity, uh, including companies like Palo Alto Networks or others? I know there's one called Hack, but it's not, of course, State Street or BlackRock. Is that something where you may go at one point? Yeah, so first question first. I think 
regulators are putting an enormous amount of scrutiny on the ETF industry overall. Um, and I think the, you know, the answers we've given them as an industry, as individually, that have satisfied their concern about any sort of systemic risk, because the mechanism by which ETFs work offers you know, a kind of safety valve, if you like. And that's in contrast to some of the other you know, financial instruments like mutual funds where people have to liquidate, they have to provide cash really, really fast. And so I think ETFs have some benefits, but they are a mechanism that will facilitate herding. So if you've got an underlying problem, which is investors are herding, then the ETFs or mutual funds will be a mechanism for that to happen. And so what you really want in the ETF market and elsewhere is you want a very heterogeneous set of investors who've got different viewpoints at different times and will be a bit of a self-regulating mechanism. Um, and I think the more we globalize the ETF business and operate across different channels, the more we get that heterogeneous system. On the I don't have an answer to your second question as to what we might be planning, but we do think that the th thematic drivers within the ETF business are very important. So identifying you know, important drivers, whether it be ESG or other factors or themes that are important. But we don't want to <clears throat> put out there themes that are so transient that they really don't offer a substantial and enduring return story for investors. Hoda? <clears throat> Hi, my name is Hoda Abu Jamra. I'm with TVM Capital Healthcare Partners. <clears throat> we invest in healthcare in emerging market, Minas and Southeast Asia, so we're very bullish on Southeast Asia. Uh, I have a small comment. I'm very happy to see a couple of gentlemen focusing on financial return, believing sincerely in ESG and gender diversity and considering it a business case and not just something nice to do um, because we're all here, you know, business people that need to make money for our investors. So gender diversity represent the clients that we serve so if you do have it in your C level, it's good for business and increased return. Um, and I would love next year, hopefully, to have a woman uh, business finance on this panel and maybe some more diversity and <laughs> cultural diversity. Um, my question um, was more about uh, emerging market. I think you answered part of it. but. Uh, and it's interesting to see that Asia, China, but also Southeast Asia is of interest. What other private equity uh, what, uh, interest in emerging market? What is the next emerging market that is interesting for you other than Asia? Uh, in the private side, maybe I, I should refer to my colleagues on the private side of the business. Um, I think we talked a lot about China. Um, I think India is the other, obviously the other big economy that's going through transformation. I think it sometimes look, well, perennially looks expensive and it has many political challenges that are holding back private sector. Um, but I think if you were to ask, you know, again, the other long-term bet that we would have, it would be on India because the economy is large and it's going through a transformation that seems to be consistent with um, developing wealth and developing standards of living more broadly. So in that sense, it's a kind of sustainable story within India um, that means that we may see, you know, a, a continuing surge of, of um, you know, liberalization that will benefit not just the population, but investors as a whole. Also has democracy and English speakers, right? I mean, that, that doesn't, doesn't hurt. The most compelling um, market that, that I've heard at the conference so far is uh, Mexico. Someone made a very compelling uh, case for Mexico. Uh, and he happens to be the person whose name is on this conference. And I was blown away and it, because it was, quite frankly, a market that, that I wasn't looking at. Um, Hoda, I think, the other, you, I think you raised a great point uh, in, in the beginning of your, your question. Um, we've actually studied uh, what's the optimal investment decision making in terms of the balance between males and females. And our office is actually 50-50. And a 50-50, any, anything uh, after 70%, uh, 70-30 is okay, uh, but 50-50 is better. You actually make longer-term uh, investment decisions, less emotional decisions. Uh, so we're strong advocates of um, having balance, uh, and although this panel doesn't look very balanced, behind our organization is a very balanced uh, group of, of, of individuals that are making investment decisions. And if I may, um, on the emerging market question, uh, I am a bit of a contrarian, um, you know, enthusiasm in China and, and the subcontinent notwithstanding. 
I, I do think that generally in emerging markets, certainly in private equity, when you overlay the higher risk profile of private equity and emerging markets, a currency uh, risk, I think you have a cocktail that is very difficult to, uh, to manage. And I'm not sure the experiences certainly in Africa and in Latin America and private equity are wide enough uh, for us to conclude that those are proven sub-asset classes, basically, as you go into these countries. Only the currency movements over five years can completely annihilate your investment. You, you, you have currency movements of 30-40% in these countries within that period of time. That will kill you know, an investment. Um, quick question, Mark Wickroft. Um, technology is clearly changing a lot of industries. You're obviously investing in technology or technology companies or funds. In terms of your day-to-day, -day, how do you see technology changing the way that you do things? Uh, I mean, in our business, it's changed it tremendously. I mean, we're, we have private equity. We're also in the markets every day. And um, the amount of technology that's taken over operations and risk uh, is, is, is mind-boggling, in my view, over the last five years. Um, you know, we're able to do a separate account business for individual separate accounts through a, you know, kind of a fintech company that started two years ago. Love to throw its name out, but I shouldn't. Um, it's, it's a great business. Um, so I think fintech has helped the plumbing of our business tremendously. Um, in terms of investing in it, I would go back to the question about, you know, kind of uh, cybersecurity. In, in, there's one of the reasons I didn't mention it, but one of the reasons why the Federal Reserve wants the, the banking system to get down to 2,000 banks from 5,000 is their worries about the plumbing of the financial institutions of smaller banks that don't have, you know, some of the, some of the security, you know, uh, kind of protections that you might worry about, right? Because everyone, every small bank trades through J.P. Morgan as well. So they're trying to bring in consolidation because of technology concerns. Um, and, you know, we have to have a tremendous amount of, of uh, spend on just protecting our firm from, you know, kind of everything from ransomware to, you know, ransom attacks to, you know, just email attacks. I mean, it's, it's, it's really mind-boggling, the spend. And if I were looking at an asset manager, I would absolutely, and we're seeing that in the questions that are being, you know, through due diligence, you know, what, what's your spend? I mean, you know, who are your people? You know, are you self-evaluating? Um, and I, I think, I'm, you know, these are obviously great institutions that Daniel and Rick are with, um, but, you know, we, we put so much effort into it because it's a, it's a huge risk. Um, but it's also, it's also the answer. It's the key, you know. So. Neil, I think it's a great point. I mean, I can tell you the, some of the managers that we're investing in, um, we always ask them, how much are you spending on R&D? Because especially in hedge funds and some of these other firms, R&D meant uh, a private plane and a house in the Hamptons. <laughs> and what we want to know is sort of what, what, how are you improving? How are you getting better? Are you a learning organization that's getting better? And many of our managers are spending now close to $100 million um, in data alone. And, and to your question on technology, I think it's completely changing uh, the investment management business. And um, anyone that's not embracing it, um, I think it's going to be a dinosaur. Uh, gone are the days where you can sit with a 10Q and a 10K in a room and uh, calculate a Graham and Dodd uh, calculation and buy the stock. Um, anyway, I want to thank everyone for coming. We're out of time. Really appreciate it. I hope it was helpful for everyone.